I think it's really common to have a strong connection to the land if you're from Appalachia or if you're from a rural place, period. I think especially when you're from the mountains, you have a connection to it because you walk outside and you can't deny there's a mountain in front of you. The mountain dictates where you build your house, where you put the road. It's sort of the boss. The mountains are sort of the boss in a way. And so you can't deny that. It becomes a part of you and part of your identity. Most mountain folk understand that if we pollute the streams, there aren't going to be any fish there. Most mountain folk understand that if we strip mine the top of a mountain, uh, there's not going to be any wildlife there. Most mountain folk understand what the mountains themselves mean to us as a people. Uh, and yet they also have to survive. So they are caught in the middle of, of, this, larger, of this larger debate. It's so the latest time that a land uh, agent has been here to want to want to strip mine part of the property that I own. And I just have a little, a little patchwork of 20 acres here. And up where the, the coal they want to strip is only about six and a half acres or so. But it was part of a bigger plot. They bought out the neighbors on the other side of the hill. They just pretty well bought the whole place. And uh, then what, after they do that, to try to expand their mining, they go around to neighbors on the other side of the hill and they pick off little places like my little six acres. And uh, I had to decide, it wasn't the first time, it's been a couple times land agents have come up in the yard and blow their horn and make sure the dogs don't bite. And then they come in and they do their, do their spiel. I see that for, for me the us, well I don't want to say us and them and I don't want to use the term war because I don't, I, I think that that rhetoric gets us into a whole other place that is not productive and then it, it puts ideas into our head about what this is about. Uh, and then you know once you say war then you're either for me or against me and it polarizes to the degree that you can't think about it. Uh, you can't hear each other. Well, they came up here on, started to drill a well up here on your dad, your grandpa's land. And uh, we didn't know what was going on. They just moved in and didn't, didn't tell us anything about it. The doors are working up there. Said he's gonna drill a well. And I said, I don't think this is your land. And, yeah, but we have the right to come home. And uh, so we got to, I got together with your, your pa and we went up there and ran them off. And I told them to leave the dozer sitting right there. We, not to take it with them, just to get out and go on. They left their dozer. And the guy that owned the dozer in Knott County, he called and says, if you'll let me get my dozer out of there, I'll never be back there again. And so he never did come back. And they never did drill the well. Like one camp thinks, if I speak out against coal at all, that I'm not a patriot, that I'm betraying my heritage, then some people think that if you don't speak out against the devastation that's going on, that you're not being a, a true patriot and you're not being true to your heritage because the Appalachian people have always fought back to coal companies and people who are coming in from outside places and destroying their land. Grandpa put in 47 years in the mines. He started out in what they call the pony mines. And he took care of the, the little short mules, the short ponies that went back in the mines. It was his first job. And my dad worked 20 years in the mines. That's the industry here. If you work and you make a living, it is tied to the coal mines. But I can see that because we don't have something to offer, to say, here are, here are the jobs. You know, we, we're, we don't have a new industry or a diversified industry to bring to the mountains, then it seems like it's pretty um, presumptuous of me to say they should shut down mountaintop removal 
without something to offer. This, this issue of land use uh, has always been part of the conversation uh, in, in the region. Uh, it's always been part of the struggle within the mountains. If you know the history of coal, you know that from the very beginning, you're riding high in April and shot down in May. I mean, it's just, that's the, that's the nature of the business. Between strikes in the 40s and the 20s and 30s, well, in the 40s when the unions started getting real big. And uh, between mining strikes, between the industry being shut down, between, you know, times of recession, the coal business is up and down, and there's layoffs, and the, and the, you can be doing really well, and then the mine shuts down. I mean, people ask me all the time, why don't people in Appalachia rise up and stop this? It's because they're doing everything they can to survive. You know, they're trying to make a living. They're just trying to do the best they can. It's not because they don't care. It's not because they're lazy. It's because they've been put in a situation where they have to just do the best they can to get by. I'd be tempted because I would be able to control that few acres back there. And my neighbors would sell, these neighbors would sell, on the backside they'd sell. I'd be the guy standing there with one little clump of oak trees on it and a big rock or two. And the other side of it would be, I might be able to negotiate as I said, a pond that I could plumb up and have water down here on the rest of my ground, you know, water my gardens, uh, have, you know, a pretty good source of decent water. I think they have to make a decision, and I think it's sometimes hard for them to make. Uh, what do you use? Is you take care of, you've got to take care of your family. And then on the other side, you've got to see what's going on, and you don't like what's going on with the, with the companies and so on. And you've got, you got to make a decision. And right now, I'm still straddling the fence. I have tree huggers that are upset with me because I sound like I'm pro strip mining, which I'm not and I have strip mining neighbors who may be a little upset because I sound like a tree hugger that wants to stop their jobs, which I'm not. I, I can kind of see both sides of it. I just, I just don't know what the future holds. And I'm glad I don't. No, it doesn't look good at all. It's the first time we've been in a situation like we are right now. Because we've had this slow runs on coal and so on. But I don't know. The coal business may be about over. With. One of the things that we have learned from the history of the region is that as long as our public policy decisions are made by a small group of individuals, then the, our options are going to be very narrow and are not going to address the wider needs of the population. One of the things we have learned for many years of trying to promote change in the mountains is that we need more conversations. We need more people brought to the discussion so I just think we have to look at everything in a real complex way and we can't just... We have to educate, we have to self-educate. We can't just listen to WYMT, we can't just listen to KFTC, we can't just listen to Arch Minerals. You know, we have to educate ourselves and look at all those things. I think people in the mountains love the mountains and want to stay there. It, we have lived there for generations and I think some of us will continue to live there. Uh, and we'll find a way to survive.